Hey guys, Dan here with Battlefield Curator. Do you have collectibles made of leather? Slings, pouches, and other weapon accessories made of leather should be curated properly. And I don't think in the military surplus collecting community there's enough discussion about how to curate these leather relics. So today we got a very special guest on the show. Army combat veteran, entrepreneur, and professional leathersmith, Daryl Phillips with DP Custom Leatherworks. So we'll start off with Daryl telling us how he got into leathersmithing. So I started leatherworking roughly about 30 years ago when I was in Cub Scouts. Uh, the first piece that I ever made was a pair of moccasins, which ended up going into the trash because I wasn't very happy with it. Um, and then after that, I went ahead and went into Boy Scouts, continued doing leathersmithing, uh, making belts, wallets, pouches, and then uh, ended up getting a job later on when I was in my high school years uh, working for a saddlesmith and uh, learning a lot of number one how to hand stitch and uh, went from there learning how to tool um, and I did a lot of my tooling at Tandy Leathercraft and Fort Worth at the Tandy Center and uh, Jim Linnell was very helpful in teaching me how to tool leather and how to work with leather. So Daryl, so not only are you self-taught uh, in the beginning, but you're so enthusiastic about it, you actually went out and sought a mentor, Jim Linnell. Um, so how influential was he on your leather making uh, and, and how did he actually help you get to where you're at now? Working with Jim, a uh, very professional man, um, just his ideas, when it comes down to making any kind of mark on leather, um, making your own design, uh, even going into the work that it takes to use tools. Um, let's say to make a belt that has oak leaves with acorns. I didn't realize how long the process takes, but it's actually, it takes a, it's, it's a labor of love in order to do it. And with that, it just sparked interest in me to uh, be able to create anything that I wanted to with leather. Um, and it, it just grew from there. All right, so when it comes to leather making, what is it you enjoy most about it? So with leather making, the thing that I enjoy the most out of it is taking something that is flat um, and actually being able to make something that you can use on an everyday basis. It doesn't matter whether if it's a leather sheath or a wallet, a belt, anything. Just knowing that I can actually make something and the customer can be happy about it and knowing that it's going to be a timepiece that is gonna last um, maybe even through that customer's lifetime that could possibly be passed down to their children and even their grandchildren. All right, so I understand that you're an Army combat veteran. Um, were you still leather making and leather smithing while you were in the military? So I did create things in the Army um, that was needed for everyday work in the Army. Stuff that I couldn't find online, stuff that um, I just couldn't find that other designers had an idea of what was needed. So what I did is I ended up handcrafting some pouches uh, handcrafting some shooting mats um, that were very helpful for my job. Yeah, and I can understand that. I mean, while I was overseas, I, I had a watch that broke, the watch band broke. So what I ended up doing is taking 550 cord and making my own watch band out of it. Um, so you didn't really like sell it. So when did you actually start your business selling leather goods? When did you realize that, hey, I, you know, I have such a, a craft that, you know, I, I should start a business? So I got back into it roughly 2018. And the reason why is because I was looking for a shave kit of all things um, that was number one, inexpensive, but with leather that I could, I wanted something just made out of leather that was, that was worthwhile, something that would last, something that wouldn't just fall apart and that wasn't ridiculously expensive. So I decided to go ahead and make one. And then it just sparked my interest that much more. Um, and I just enjoy, I, I forgot that I, through my military career, that I loved working with leather so much. So that sparked more of an interest. And then I was like, you know what? Why not go ahead and make belts? 
you know, so I made a few belts for myself and I was like, hey, what about a wallet? So I went ahead and made a wallet as well. And then it just went from there and people started seeing some of the stuff that I was making and they're like, hey, can you make me one? So I was like, you know what? Sure. So I went ahead and uh, made my business, uh, made up my model and everything else, which was extremely easy to do. Um, and then I started my own business doing it. And it's one of the best things I've, I've done. So you were definitely able to market your leather by just wearing it around. And, and that sparked interest. Other people saw the creativity and said, hey, you know, that's really cool looking. Um, let me get some of that. You know, can I get some? Uh, so would you say that your uh, marketing was just kind of uh, personal, like just, you know, in, within your friends group, within the associates, the people that you hung out with? Or would you say that you did you actually like market online or did you did you market anywhere else? So with that, a lot of the marketing, especially when it comes down to leather, people want to feel it. People want to touch it um, to find out, number one, the quality. They want to see what that leather feels like. Um, so more of it is personal. Uh, when, you know, when somebody goes and meets me, let's say if I'm even at a restaurant and I pull out my wallet to go pay, um, it grabs interest. And people are like, oh, wow, where did you make that? Or where did you get that? And I let them know that I made it. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah. So then I hand out my business card and it goes from there. Um, I mean, so when I went to go vote, I pulled out my wallet to show my ID and, uh, you know, it sparked interest in one of the ladies there and she ended up buying a wallet from me that was very similar to that design because that design is something that you really can't find online. And I just uh, wanted to make a wallet that was very different that would actually work with my needs. So you're able to market, uh you know, within a small network of people that you associated with. Um, were you able to, uh, do you have any distribution deals? Are you in any stores? Uh, were you able to talk to any shop owners and maybe get your, your leather products out there? So I am in a, in a local store. Um, I, it was hard for me to find a local store that I felt uh, met with the ideals that I have uh, in leathersmithing. Um, you know, quality is a huge piece to me and I wanted something that to go into a store that actually had quality pieces, but I'm also a Christian man, and I wanted a store that had Christian ethics. And there's a local store called Genesis Law, which the law stands for land, air, water. And, uh, you know, Tony, the owner, um, allowed me to come in and sell my products out of her store, and it's been great. All right, so what kind of leather products do you, do you have in there? So some of the things that I have in her store are some of my leather belts that I've made, uh, some vanity trays. Um, let's see here. I also have some bracelets, um, some cuff links, and some cuffs and wallets. All right. And, and can, are these available on your website as well? They are available on my website as well. Now, I, I understand like leather making, there's a lot of tools required. So uh, could you go over uh, where you acquired some of your tools and um, how long you know, you've been acquiring the tools for these? So I've been having leather tools for over 30 years. Um, some of my tools I go, um, you know, I, I could find maybe even at a garage sale. Maybe I could find at an old leathersmith that is getting ready to close shop. Um, I've also bought a lot of tools online. When I first started, I used to go to Tandy all the time. Uh, Tandy is great um, with their tools, but it's not, all, not all of their tools are pro tools. Pro tools uh, meaning something that you can use every single day. Um, now they actually have a pro line, which is very good tools, and I use a lot of those as well. All right. So now we'll just kind of go into uh, like how leather is made, maybe some uh, leather pro tips, you know, uh, you know, for the audience out there. Uh, they're not, you know, like we all know leather what has been used for centuries on end. Uh, and there's just so much that I think nowadays we've gotten away from actually making a lot of products out of animal uh, skins and animal uh it, it just kind of got away from making products out of animals altogether. A lot of things are made synthetically these days. So can you give us a short explanation on how leather is made? So leather is made once it goes to a tannery. 
what the tannery does is there's a huge difference between veg tan and chrome XL tan. So a veg tan is uh, usually used with a lot of natural products like roots and barks. And what that does is uh, it actually makes a veg tan or a very pliable leather um, that is very nice. And that's one thing that I like to use rather than the Chrome XL tan uh, leather. Now the Chrome XL has bits of metal that are put into it uh, during the processing and there's more chemicals. So I like to use a lot of the veg tan because a lot of the products that I make are going to be close to the skin and I don't want anyone to be getting cancer. Wait, cancer? Uh, what do you mean by cancer? So certain people, um, you know, depending on how their body mechanics are, are more susceptible to take in the metals. Let's say if you're wearing a watch band that was made with Chrome XL and you go to the gym and you're sweating. Well, during that, you're also going to be wetting down that leather. And if it's not properly sealed, then some of that metal could actually go into your skin. And eventually over time, um, you could actually, it could help for cancer. Not saying, not saying that Chrome XL is going to give you cancer, but it increases more of that risk. Uh, what's the difference between uh, high quality leather and low quality leather? So when it comes down to leather, uh, a lot of people have a misconception when it says genuine leather. Genuine leather is more of a bottom of the barrel leather. Um, a lot of people are not familiar with words like top grain leather or high grain leather. Your high grain leather is the highest quality of leather that any person could ever have. And the great thing about the high grain leather is you'll have certain marks, let's say tick marks, cut marks, um, even your branding marks are on high grain leather. And one great thing about high grade leather is it patinas very well. And then just underneath that is your top grain leather. Now your top grain leather has actually been sanded down. Um, so now those imperfections on that leather is no longer there. But the downside to a lot of your top grain leather is it needs to have a shining agent or like a leather sheen um, that is put on it for it to actually have that pretty shine that everyone looks for on leather. So what's the difference between the leather that you use and, it, and the, the products that you make compared to some of the leather that's used in some of the off-the-shelf, you know, run-of-the-mill stores out there? So the main difference with the leather products that I make compared to what is at your local stores is number one, all of my products are made by hand. Um, and what I mean by that is all of the leather is cut by hand, by myself and I actually sew everything by hand as well. There's no machines ever used on any of my products. And another thing is I use high and top grain leather only. I do not use genuine leather and most of your local stores like let's say Walmart, all they use basically is your genuine leather because Americans have deemed genuine leather as great leather. So obviously uh, you talked about it earlier how genuine leather is a misconception. Um, what are the grades? So the different grades of leather starting from the highest quality to the lowest quality is your high grade leather, then underneath that is your top grain leather, your mid grain leather, and then after that is your genuine leather, and then at the very, very bottom, um, worst when it comes down to strength, is your split grade leather or suede leather. And your suede leather is what a lot of your combat army boots are made of now. So now we know kind of how leather is made. We know the different grades. Uh, how does leather decay over time? So leather decays over time, number one, with wear and tear. Um, one of the worst things that you could ever do is have that, have that leather go through water and then just let it set in sun um, and just leaving it. Neglect is one thing that is the worst thing for leather. Um, leather needs to be cleaned consistently and it also needs to have a conditioning agent. Uh, one great conditioning agent that I use is Neat's Foot Oil and it actually helps 
condition that leather and clean that leather uh, back to its original properties to keep from the pores breaking down. And so how often should someone do that to help keep their leather products from decaying? My recommendation number one depends on how much usage you have. Um, if it's going to be in harsh environments, uh, let's say with your saddle, I would recommend actually using some oil like neat's foot oil to recondition your saddle. If you're going to be riding out quite a bit, I would recommend probably about every six months. Oh, okay. So do you have a lot of experience with saddle making and saddles? I, well, I worked for a saddlesmith for roughly four years. Um, very similar to the same things that Don Gonzalez does out of Texas. Okay, so it looks like you have a pretty broad uh, area of expertise when it comes to uh, leather products. So you've, you've kind of dove into the small stuff, like your wallets and your belts, and, and you also have experience with some of the larger leather items, uh, like your saddles. So when it comes to like storing your leather products, uh, where is the best place to in your house if, if you're going to store them, where would you store them? It's best to go ahead and store them more so at room temperature and away from light. Try to keep it away from any kind of sunlight at all. And that's, there, oh, go ahead. and that's one of the best places, let's say even a closet. A closet is a great place because it's regulated and your leather isn't going to be seeing any kind of sunlight for it to set. Is there any potential for mold or moisture buildup on the leather that might damage it? Yes. Yeah, so if you're going to be storing, let's say if you're at a horse stable, right? Um, and you go ahead and store a lot of your leather products there, um, it tends to have the opportunity, especially here in Georgia or South Carolina, to collect a lot of moisture because of all the moisture that's in the air. Um, now there's also products out there like a leather sheen uh, that you can put on um, a lot of your leather products and that helps. And uh, leather sheen, so leather sheen, uh, the needs foot oil, and what was the other product that you were saying uh, that will help with preservation? Uh, any kind of conditioning agent. I mean, Kiwi even has a really good conditioner. Um, you know, you could even use a neutral um, that helps with that as well. Um, I mean, you couldn't go wrong if you're using Neat's foot oil and then you go ahead and use uh, some of your, like a Kiwi product for your conditioning with neutral and then afterwards maybe, maybe even go over it with a leather sheen which will help protect that leather over time. So when it comes to uh, collectibles, some older pieces of leather, you know, that probably already been somewhat used and abused, um, you know, so for someone who collects, uh, do you have any best practices for those guys? I mean, I know you went over storage a little bit, but is there anything else that you probably want to add in there? Just making sure that it's conditioned. Um, Let's say if you have a rifle sling that is very almost crisp, one of the best things you could do is actually use the Neat's Foot Oil, which helps condition those pores. Uh, so now that leather is going to be more malleable. It's not going to crack um, just when you go ahead and touch it. What it'll do is it'll condition those pores um, to where they're not suffering and almost being like a sheet of paper or a sheet of cardboard. Um, and with that oil, it's actually going to condition that leather and make it a lot more malleable. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you know, I've seen some things made of leather before. And one of the most interesting things I've seen that's a collectible is a German sword. And the, the handle was made out of uh, shark skin leather. And I thought that was really interesting. So, uh, what animals can be used or what animals, you know, do, would you use, uh, for leather making? So with leather making, I can use just about any kind of leather off of any animal. I mean, leather is a hide, um, so it doesn't matter if it's alligator, which is an amazing skin, um, your rhino, your elephant, which are very tough. Um, and I definitely use a lot of cow skin. I mean, I use beaver skin, shark skin, um, fish. Uh, hide is actually another one that is great. It's actually one of the first leathers that was ever used in clothing for humans. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I never knew that you could use so many different types of animals for leather making uh, until, you know, I started looking a little bit further into it and now you kind of shed more light on uh, what, what's been used. Um, so what's probably the most popular uh, out of all the animals used for leather? The most popular would definitely be cow. 
Um, and I think it's because of the accessibility and the affordability. Um, now you also have some great leathers that are going to last a lifetime, uh, with that being some Stingray, um, even your alligator or gator, um, which a lot of people use for your gun sheets. And that's going to last you a complete lifetime. Okay, well that's pretty interesting. Uh, what would you say is the highest quality animal to, you could use for leather? Probably one of the highest quality ones that you could use for leather. Um, I would say a stingray. Stingray is very, very tough, but it's also thin. Um, but it's also very hard to work with, especially if you are handcrafting every bit of it, because it has little marks on them. They're little circular marks, and all those little circular marks are actually calcium. It's a calcium that makes the stingray so very strong. Well, on top of that, it's also um, waterproof. All right, well, thanks for sharing that information about how all the animals that you can use for leather. We're gonna go back to uh, some collectibles. So what I did was I brought some uh, slings and some other collectibles that are made of leather that have kind of just been beat up over time. So uh, I'm gonna hand them to you and just kind of give me your insight on what you could do to you know, preserve some of these or try to, try to bring, them back, uh, bring them back to life. All right, so the first thing I got here is a uh, Western style. It's actually a a kid's uh, holster, and it, it looks pretty beat up. Uh, so, what what can you tell me about this? So, this is a gun belt. Um, and actually, somebody spent some great time on it because I see some of the tool marks that are on it. This is actually made out of a cowhide, um, and it's actually patinaed very well. Uh, so, this is actually more of a high grade leather oh wow and that, i would believe that would have been made in the 1950s uh you know that you could have bought them at a store and a general store and it would have came with a cap gun and the kids you know would have been outside playing with those so obviously that that had broken uh right there where the holster is um, so is there a way to fix that that breakage there so th this breakage is very easy to fix it's just using um another leather, basically the same type of leather, uh, cow leather, and actually stitching. And you can actually put it back together using another piece of leather. You just can't glue leather back together. Um, granted, it's made out of pores, but for the strength, you're definitely not gonna be just gluing it together. You wanna be able to you know, sew it together, and then it'll, it'll last a great deal of time after that. Okay, and then, like you were saying before, maybe some needs foot oil, like how do you preserve Yeah, this? some needs foot oil would be great on this. Um, granted, the malleability on this leather is still really good. I love the patina color to it. Um, another thing that could be used is almost like a shoe polish. Uh, instead of using the polish part of it, I would actually use a neutral. So what I would do is just use like a terry cloth and uh, first use some saddle soap. And saddle soap will actually first clean the leather really well with a little bit of water and terry cloth and saddle soap. Uh, once that dries, then I would go ahead and use a conditioning agent like your Neats foot oil. Um, and it doesn't, I wouldn't say that this would need a lot of Neats foot oil, but then after that dries, that oil dries and soaks in really good to those pores, then I'd probably go over with a neutral. And then uh, once that neutral is put in and those pores start uh, soaking in that neutral, you'll actually notice more of like a glossy coat coming down on it. And then after that, I would just use a shoe brush or a shoe shine brush and uh, go over it and shine it up. And then after that, it's ready to go. All right, so here we go. Here's a sling here. And uh, this seems pretty cracked. It's kind of stiff. What do you say about that one? Okay, so with the stiffness on this, a little bit of oil will go a long way. Um, I like to use Neats foot oil. Um, it soaks into the pores very well and it'll keep from the cracking. Now, some of these cracks are pretty deep cracks. So one of the best things is just to have the sling, if you're gonna be using it, um, just to have it recreated. Um, I don't see anything truly spectacular about this sling. Um, it definitely looks like it was handmade uh, there is some stitching on it that was hand done uh, rather than using a machine, um, which shows the quality 
is great on it. Um, but with the cracking, yeah, some of these cracks are really deep. I don't think the oil would actually be able to work with that. Oh, wow. And that's a World War II Italian Carcano sling uh, that was later marked SA by Finland. So it was used in Italy and then used in Finland, uh, as far as I gather from it. So with that, um, you definitely wouldn't be using it every day. Um, so one thing that you could easily do um, if you wanted to fix a lot of these cracks is, number one, use some neat foot oil, which will help condition this leather and soften up those pores. And then what you can do is you can actually use a, uh, a cement or type of glue. Um, I use barges glue or barges cement. And what it, what it will do is when you put it in the cracks, it'll actually help seal them, um, but it won't help with the malleability, but it will help fix those cracks a little bit, especially if you're just gonna be using that sling for storage um, on that rifle. All right. Thank you. All right, so the next one here, this is a bayonet, and this is a M1 carbine bayonet, and it would have been used during World War II as well. Uh, the leather uh, is pressed leather on the handle there. What do you say about that? Number one, it's gorgeous quality. Um, this leather, like you said, is a pressed leather. So what it is, it's leather on top of leather on top of leather that has been pressed down um, to make the handle. And then what, what the individual did is they went ahead and sanded it down to actually make it a handle. Um, one of the easiest ways to preserve this is number one, to clean it using saddle soap and water. Let that dry, then afterwards go over with some, some great oil. Uh, I recommend Neat's Foot Oil again. Um, and it, what it'll do, it'll help revive a lot of those pores and uh, Increase the help increase the patina that's going to have on this. It's never going to look brand new again, which is, I think, one of the greatest factors of old leather like this because of the patina, um, which will make it look unlike anything else. Awesome, awesome. All right, and what we got here is a uh, Carabiner 98K rifle sling, uh, probably post World War II, but it looks kind of like. It's been in the desert, it looks dirty. What would you say about that one? So one thing is I would use to clean it would be your saddle soap and water. I can definitely tell that this was actually handmade. I see the stitching that is all done by hand, um, which is great craftsmanship. Uh, if this leather was actually in the desert, they took very good care of it. Um, I even see some tool marking that's going all the way along this belt which I'm sure at one time when it was first made, it was gorgeous. A uh, little, little bit of saddle soap and water would definitely help clean this belt. And then afterwards I'd go over maybe just a little bit of oil. Um, and then after that, I'd probably go with some conditioning agent from like, I, I like to use Kiwi, um, that neutral because it helps with the polish, helps with the shine. I like a lot of my leather to have a really pretty shine to it. Uh, what can you tell me about this one? This is another uh, Mauser rifle sling, and it looks like it's got some white stuff on there. Yeah, so there's some white stuff on here, um, which is a mold. Um, now, I can also tell that these rivets right here are actually brass. The way that I can tell that is because there's a greenish blue, um, which is typical when a little bit of water gets on that brass, and then the pores, it starts growing that uh, mold on it. Uh, one of the easiest things to go ahead and do to take off the mold would be use saddle soap. Uh, once you let that saddle soap set in with the water, let it dry, let it air dry for a really good time. I'd say in between 24 to 48 hours. Uh, after that's done, uh, go ahead and hit it with a saddle soap again, um, and then make sure that it's very well rinsed with the water. And when you do that, once it dries, it's gonna be a lot harder, uh, almost like cardboard. So then what I would do is I would use some oil uh, replenishing agent and conditioning agent all in one, which I go back to Neat's Foot Oil. And then after that, I'd probably go with a conditioning agent, more like your neutral uh, or shoe polish, and then buff it out. Um, do not ever use bleach on leather to try to take off that mold. All right, awesome. All right, so that was a lot of pro tips there, and I hope the audience can really learn from uh, a lot of the things that you talked about. 
All right, so where can people find you on social media? So the social media platforms that I'm on is actually I have my own website at dpcustomleatherworks.com. I can also be found on Instagram and Facebook uh, underneath the same tagline. All right, Daryl, thanks for your insight on leather curation. Uh, guys, I hope you've learned a lot from Daryl Phillips with DP Custom Leatherworks. Uh, he's been quite the inspiration to me uh, to get my leather products shined and, and preserved uh, because obviously those products that I showed him, uh, those items that I showed him were uh, mine. Uh, and, and they've not been best, kept in the best condition over time. So I hope to get them to a, a restored state and probably will post it on my social media. And again, Daryl Phillips with DP Custom Leatherworks. And you can find us at Battlefield Curator uh, on Instagram, Facebook, and here's our YouTube page. So if you haven't already, be sure to pulverize that like button and subscribe for the algorithms. And uh, don't forget to learn history and curate history. Make it a great day.